Okay. Hello. Hello. <laughs> I am Courtney Lytle. I am your lawyer for the morning. Um, I practice here in Atlanta. I teach part-time at Emory Law School. I do some small business stuff, startups, and a fair amount of intellectual property, which is really what we're talking about today. Most specifically, copyright law. I'm going to have some intro remarks kind of set the stage and go over the basics of what I think you need to know. If you have some questions, we should have time for that at the end. But I wanted to make sure that we go over some of the framework first because a lot of the questions that you have, I'll get there first and then we'll answer them. Um, so we'll start with the very basic stuff. There are four types of intellectual property protection. The first one I'm going to dismiss fairly quickly, which is patents. Patents are for people way smarter than I am. It's the really hard science stuff. And actually in this room, some of you are those people. My last panel was over at the art show. I'm just making assumptions, but there are more sciencey people here than there were there. Just a hunch. But patents are the things for your inventions, for your processes, for your machines, for your pharmaceuticals. Those are patents. If you have some sort of invention that you want to patent, you need a patent lawyer. And I say that specifically because patent lawyers, well, they're different from the rest of us. We have a kind of standard, what we sort of call it a joke, but it's really just true um, amongst lawyers that if we could do math and science, we'd be doctors, but we can't, so we aren't. Um, we have calculators, and that's about it. In college, my science class was astronomy, because you had to take either astronomy, biology, chemistry, or physics, and so I took astronomy and I met a lot of really nice athletes and we had a lovely time and that was the last science I took which means I couldn't even <coughs> apply to take the patent bar had I so desired so if you have a patent that you need to file or that you need information on please make sure that whatever attorney you speak to is an honest to God member of the patent bar that's a separate qualification which only the super smart guys who can do both words and science go into. There's kind of an assumption with a lot of engineers and science folks that you've got a whole lot of brilliant science stuff in your brain and not a whole lot of fluid communication and writing skills sometimes. That's what we like to tell ourselves at least because we can't do the science and math part. But the ones who can do both, those are your patent lawyers. Don't take a lawyer who just says, yes, I know about patents. Make sure it's one that's actually a member of the patent bar. It'll cost you a lot of money, it'll take you a long time. But it's great protection if you need it. We're not talking about that today. Another one that's um, sometimes relevant um, for this group is trade secrets. Trade secrets are kind of interesting because it's anything for your business that you find valuable. A list, a process, um, it can be your client list, it can be um, the formula for your red fizzy um, carbonated caramel colored caffeinated beverage in a red can. Um, the secret formula for Coca-Cola seriously is kept in a vault. It is secret because they keep it secret. They take lots of steps to make sure no one gets it and it has remained secret since their founding. If they had patented it, even if that were possible, they would have had to disclose it and the patent would have long since expired. Trade secrets last as long as you keep them a secret. And there are lots of particular things you need to do and steps you need to take to make your trade secret protectable as a legal matter. I mean, you can start with the basic. The way to keep a secret is not to tell anyone. Well, that doesn't really work for your business very well. So you will need to tell people, but there's agreements and steps and reasonable precautions. And those are fairly detailed, but you can keep something a secret and the law will help you keep it a secret, basically. That's not really what we're talking about today either, but just throw that in your mind in case it comes up for something you need. Trademarks are often overlapped in a lot of people's minds with copyrights. Trademarks are a different thing altogether. Also, so I'm getting rid of the ones we're not really talking about. Trademarks, here we go, look, this is a trademark, I'm sure. I'm not sure what trademark that is. I have no idea whose that is. Good living. Um, someone in here has a 
beverage container with a emblazoned logo. Let me see your smart water. Perfect. I promise I'll give it back. <laughs> Look, we know what this is because it says so on the bottle, right? Smart water. If I drink this, do I get smart? That would be kind of cool. I may not get this back. It hasn't worked oh. for me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could try. But when we see this on the bottle, we know what we're getting, right? That's what trademark's all about. To hear companies talk about protecting their trademarks, you might think that trademarks are about companies' value and their name and goodwill and all that nonsense. Trademarks actually about you guys. Very little in the law is about you guys, but trademarks are. It's so that you know what you're buying. If I buy this, I know who it came from and what's in the bottle. If I buy the happy little red can, I know what's in it and what I'm getting and where it came from. Trademarks identify the source of the goods or service. And they can be logos, it can be business names, it can be slogans, it can be things along those lines. It can be weird things like color even sometimes, but it identifies the source. I did get it back. Because I'm sorry to drink out and he's like, gross, no, I'm water cooties. <laughs> So that's what trademarks do for you. But they don't protect detailed things. Copyrights is where we're going next. That's the title of the panel, so you may have anticipated that was the last one we're going to talk about. We'll talk about it a little longer than we talked about the first ones, too. Otherwise, this would be the world's shortest panel. <laughs> Copyrights are really cool. Thank you for coming. See you next year. Um, <laughs> Copyrights are the creative stuff. They cover the books, the paintings, the songs, the movies, all of those things, and, although they shouldn't, software. Um, this is one of my crusades, is that Congress got it wrong, because software doesn't really fit in that clump with the other things, does it? All those others are creative and expressive, <coughs> and software is instructions to a machine. That's not really what copyright's about, yet it's in copyright. So even though it's really stupid and shouldn't be there, it's there, that's the law, it ain't changing. So all of those things are protected by copyright. The thing to understand, though, is it doesn't protect the substance of it. If I write a history book, the words I use and the way I arrange my book and the way I express my brilliant ideas, that's protected by the copyright. The actual facts in my book are not. You can take those and use them freely. If you're using it in academics, you're supposed to give credit, and if you don't, that's plagiarism. Plagiarism is not the same as infringement. Plagiarism is when you use someone else's information and pretend that you thought of it. Um, professors and academics really get ticked off about that. But that's plagiarism, that's not law breaking. That's just getting in trouble on an academic level. If you copied my words from my history book, that's copyright. That's federal law. If you copy the, in, the information in it and use it without citation, that's plagiarism. You're not going to jail for that. Um, but, that's just, but the information is not protected by the law, okay? So if I come up with a brilliant theory and I write my book expressing my brilliant theory, or if I have gone to England and discovered where not only King Arthur's tomb is, but that tree that Merlin ended up inside, I found them both and I'm pretty sure Merlin's still in there, I can write my book exposing that and say, aren't I brilliant? And I mean, people knew I was brilliant already, so I don't even really have to say that. But someone is free to come take that information, even though I spent years deciphering poorly transcribed old records that fall to pieces in my hands. All of that effort, and yeah, I don't care. Um, copyright law could care less about that. It's only the words I use and how I express it. So if you're trying to protect substance, copyright is not what you need. It's all about form, not function. The um, way that we describe it is it's your expression, not your idea. Okay? Now, if we're talking about a painting, that's a little easier. But if you're talking about books and software, frankly, that's where software becomes difficult because I understand there's creativity in how you write the software, but the expression is really all about the function. Nevertheless, it's in there. When you want to copyright something, I have good news for you, all you have to do is write it down. Federal copyright attaches upon fixation. So when you, when you have written it down, or typed it in, or carved it, or painted it, poof, you are protected by federal copyright. 
this is not the way it used to be. You hear stories about people whose books fell into the public domain because they published it without the right notice on it, or because they published it before they filed it, or things like that. There is a whole big series of cases um, with the Martin Luther King estate over one of his speeches because they published a transcript of it in a um, Southern Conference newsletter, and they published it without copyright notice, so did he lose the entire copyright to the I Have a Dream speech, and lawyers got really into that for a while because we're easily amused by small things. But that law doesn't apply anymore, so you sometimes still hear about that. Ignore it. That's old stuff. Once you fix it in a tangible medium, you're protected. However, what you can do with your copyright is very limited at that point. So if it's something you care about, if it's your great novel, if it is your masterpiece of sculpture, you need to take one more step, which is to go ahead and file. You won't lose your copyright by failing to file, but you won't be able to use it as much. You can't get the same damages if you try to enforce it. Um, there are limits to, w to whether you can even show up in federal court with it, and a bunch of other things along those lines. Those are tons of litigation details. Just take, the, take my word for it. File it if you care about it. It's not expensive. It is 35 bucks, I think, per filing. It's online, copyright.gov. It's run by the Library of Congress, and it's very easy to do. You do not need a lawyer. I mean, you can pay me lots of money to do it for you if you like, but you really don't need to. Um, if you have questions as you go through, there are a few terms of art that you might go, wait a minute, is that acrylic paint or my name that goes here? And could, there's a little helpline. There are FAQs that help you. There's a helpline, which is actually helpful. But don't ask them legal advice, please, because they will not answer it. You don't get free lawyery stuff from them. But you can ask them questions about, wait, what goes in this column? Wait, I have a this. Which, which form do I use? And they'll tell you those things. Don't ask them open-ended questions like, how can I best protect this? They'll say, talk to a lawyer. But which word goes here, they will tell you. And that's easy. So do that for the stuff you actually care about. Don't rely on, oh yeah, that chick at Dragon Con said that as soon as I wrote it down, it was protected. Yeah, that chick at Dragon Con also said, then file it if you actually care about the work. Okay? Simple enough. Your copyright will last well past your death. Your heirs will have quite a while to enjoy it as well. So you're protected, but it is still a limited time. There's no second term. That's old stuff, too. You used to have to file for renewal. Nope, none of that. You get a number of rights with your copyright. Now, if oh, someone has a book, someone's got a book somewhere. I need a book. Here I go. Ha! He beat you to it. I got movies too. Um, okay, look, I have a book. I've read many of those, but not this one. I'll give it back anyway, I guess, since I'm on film, having taken it from you. I guess I'm going to give it back. Okay, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that he purchased this book somewhere. He has a lot of rights to this piece of property. What he does not have any rights to is the intangible intellectual property, the writing, okay? What's your name? Mike. Mike. Mike can rip this book to shreds if he wants. He can sell it to me. That's fine. First use. First sale doctor. Um, you can, he can sell it to me. He can give it to me. He can rip it up. He can put it on a shelf. He can carry it around in his bag. He can do anything he wants to this tangible copy, but not copy it. He also can't take characters out of this book and write a story about them. What is protected is the intangible part of this. What you own is the tangible part of this. So you can't copy it, you can't change it, you can't translate it, you can't do things along those lines. When you have software, y'all know you don't actually buy it, right? You license it. Even when you used to go to the store and take a box off the shelf and it was in shrink wrap and you took it to the cash register and you paid money and you felt, it felt like a sale, didn't it? Yeah, it wasn't. Even then, it was a license. Which means that that piece of paper that fell out of the box that you would ignore, that told you what your rights were with respect to that software. The same thing is true now when you click that stuff that you kind of go through saying, I agree, I agree, I agree, and then you download it. You're giving away some rights there because you're not buying anything. A license is the term we use for when we give you some rights 
to the IP that's in here. We say you have the right to use this on your computer, you have the right to make one archival copy. If it's Microsoft, we try very hard to give ourselves the right to sneak into your computer and disable your entire network if you're late on your renewal. They do a lot of evil stuff in some of their licensing agreements, but you don't really have any choice. This is not how most contracts work, but that's how this has developed. It's a little strange as an area of contract law. It's a different panel, I suspect. Um, I could go off on that, but I want to learn. I said lawyers get off on stupid things, and that's one of them. It's not really how contracts work. I buy things, I understand that, but if I'm licensing something, we should have looked at it together and signed an agreement, not just opened a box. And by virtue of opening the box, I have agreed to a whole bunch of terms. Every now and again, just to scare yourself, go through and read those terms. They're interesting. Thank you so much. Because sure. you're, you're get, when you have one of those licenses, how many of y'all actually read one of the EULAs? <laughs> Excellent. Did you happen to read one of them that talks about thermonuclear war? This is my favorite one because it scared the bejesus out of me. Notwithstanding the fact that I come and speak in, in this panel each year, computers hate me. They really, really do. Um, I tend to hate them back, but that's okay. Um, when I was at the big firm, our IT guy told me under no circumstances was I ever allowed to come even down the hall where the servers were kept. Whenever I started a new firm, I would kind of go introduce myself to that T guy and say, hi, you're going to get to know me pretty well. And they'd go, yeah, whatever, just another stupid lawyer. And after about the fifth time they'd come in to replace my computer because it burst into flames, um, they said, okay, you know where my office is? Never go there. Here's my pager number. Call me. Don't go near my stuff. Um, because computers just really hate me. I kid you not, I am sitting at my big lawyer desk, got my little credenza behind me. This was back when dinosaurs roamed the earth and you had, you had the big um, CPU and the screen up here. And it was sitting up on its side. Um, apparently there's supposed to be like little brackets for it. But mine was sitting up by its side against the side of the credenza. I had my back to it and I'm typing at my desk and I hear this thump. And then my screen goes, I think, well that can't be good. And I look behind me, and my computer's longer sitting up like this, it's sitting like that. There was a certain amount of gravity and impact involved there. I swear I didn't kick it. Everyone thinks I kicked it. I didn't. I was typing. It just couldn't stand the horror anymore and committed suicide. <laughs> As our IT guy was in my office switching it out again, uh, we were talking about, you know, oh, it's been a couple weeks since I've seen you. And I said, How many? it seems like you change my computer out very frequently. He's like, uh, yeah. And I said, well, how many of these do you normally change out? Now, he and I had started the firm about the same time. At this point, that was about two years we'd been here. And he looked at me and said, well, let's see, this is your fifth, right? I said, yeah, I think that's right. He said, well, I've changed out six of them since I started here. I said, you mean six in addition to mine? He's like, no. <laughs> since I've been here, I've changed out six computers. And one of them was our hot-tempered litigator who threw his expensive laptop against a wall. Hmm. I'm like, oh, and the other five were all me. He's like, yeah. He's like, seriously, don't even come near my office. <laughs> so that's where I start with computers. And as I was going through this EULA, as I was writing an article about um, an element of software licensing that's now completely obsolete, but it was really exciting at the time for academics. And I was reading through the Microsoft Word um, EULA. And I got to the part where it disclaims any responsibility or liability if my use of the program causes thermonuclear war. <laughs> I, I wish I were making this up. I swear to God it's in there. It's in my article in a footnote even. I had to include it in there. I'm like, seriously, I'm not sure this to pad the article out longer. It's because, oh my God, it says this. And I'm kind of hoping that some smart aleck um, lawyer or computer guy just put that in there um, to see if anyone ever read these. But I also was a little bit afraid because if there was some way to do something wrong with the program and cause thermonuclear war, um, we were all in danger <laughs> because I don't know what would be going wrong. My computer committed suicide, for God's sake. So that Eula concerned me. And there's all sorts of stuff in there where they're saying, oh, well, if this doesn't work and it destroys your entire livelihood and burns down your house and crashes your car and ignites nuclear warheads and all of this stuff, 
your full remedies against us will be, we'll send you a new copy of it. Hmm, that's not usually how the law works either. But when you have a license rather than a sale, you get the terms they send you. And because this is how we've all just kind of decided we like doing business, because really y'all don't want to read those things and have to negotiate with Microsoft to buy a piece of software or to license it, the terms that fall out of the box are what you get. But keep in mind, when you buy a book, it's different than licensing software. Licensing is also what we refer to if you own the IP and you are giving some of your rights away. You are selling rights to a publisher, to your novel. You are selling rights to Steven Spielberg, to your novel, to make a brilliant movie out of because you would like to be filthy rich, wouldn't we all? That's also called licensing. So when you hear attorneys talk about a license agreement, that's usually what we're talking about. The end user license agreement, the EULAs, that's that thing that falls out of the box that you clicked, I agree, I agree, without looking at. This one is more if you are the content owner and you want to give other people rights to it. This is for an artist who is making an agreement with a novelist to use cover art that the artist has drawn. This is the composer whose music is going to be synced into the film. This is the, um, you know, all of those sorts of things where you own content and you're letting someone else use it. When we talk about your copyright rights, or we talk that there's a number of things that you're protected with. You have the right to copy, you have the right to perform, you have the right to change, you have the right to, all of these sorts of things are your exclusive rights. When you license it, you can do it any way you really want to. This is something that sometimes the bigger companies will pretend isn't true and that they say, well, you know, if you're gonna license the copyright to us, you have to give us all of the rights. Yeah, that's not right, right? You can give some, few rights, you can limit it in time, you can limit the use, but the, what I want to tell you for sure is if you are entering into one of these license agreements, especially if it's for, you know, I'm giving you my art for your novel, or I am letting you have this photograph for inclusion in your book, or I am designing your website, make sure you have an agreement in place so that both sides know what you're actually licensing. Now, a little disclaimer here, I am not a trial lawyer. I am a transactional lawyer. I write contracts. Litigators tear them apart, do horrible things to our language, and make lots of money off of it. You don't really want to be in court. Unless you're a litigator, then you love that because that's how you get rich. But you don't want to be making them rich because when you go to trial, the only person who gets rich is the lawyer, generally. I mean, all of y'all have probably at some point gotten one of those class action notices. Congratulations, you were in a class action. I'm like, what? I was? Huh? Here's your, you know, $3, and you think, huh, I bet the lawyer who represented me that I didn't even know about got more than $3. Um, if you actually hire the lawyer, you may or may not do better than that 3 bucks. I mean, how many of y'all have gotten those strange class action notices at some point? Did anyone get enough to even buy coffee at Starbucks? I would talk about $1,000. Really? Yeah. Sweet! I got 7000 <laughs> I am interested to know how, but... Usually it's seriously not even coffee. That's a better deal than most people get. And you didn't even know about it ahead of time? No. Serious $7,000 windfall in the mail? It's related to the LSAT. Oh. Yeah. I'm you. Yeah. <laughs> really? I took the LSAT. They didn't give me money. Okay. So make sure you know what's in the agreement. Because you don't want to wait until there's a dispute. If the novelist and the artist are making an agreement to put, you know, the pretty picture on the cover of the novel, both of them are happy right now, right? Or if I'm commissioning you to design my web page, right now we're both happy. This is the time to make your agreement. And it doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be something I draft. That or if it were. But it doesn't have to be. If it's something like that that's straightforward, just write down the terms but make sure you're getting the details in it. Make sure you're thinking about, okay, I've purchased your artwork. Well, have I purchased your artwork? No, you're licensing me the artwork, aren't you? Okay, what then are the terms of the license? If I were purchasing your artwork, we know what that means. I own the book, but not the stuff in it. But I need to use the stuff in it, in effect. I need to use your art. So that means we're gonna make up our own terms. Can I use it on future editions? Can I sell posters of it? 
can I add different characters into it, like little color forms? You know, and say, oh, well, I have a new character, so I'm going to cut and paste this and smack it on the top of your art. Can I wash it with a color? Can I do any of these things? And how long can I use this and under what terms? Often, one of the most important things is not only how long can I use it, but what am I paying you and when? It's kind of funny how people will help you as an editor or a script doctor or any of a number of things and you think you understand what the terms are, which are I paid you a hundred bucks to help me with my novel, and they say yes, that's what I was doing, until suddenly your novel is on the New York Times bestseller list, and then they remember that they were supposed to get 10%. And you'll say, that's not what I recall. I said, no, we definitely had this conversation, you owe me money. In fact, we're joint authors, I own half your copyright. Anyone who touches your stuff as you're creating it, if you're really successful later, is going to suddenly remember that you agreed to be joint authors. Before it becomes a problem, make all the terms clear. Think ahead of time and avoid the problem, okay? Just like with medicine, preventive medicine is way cheaper and way less painful than curing what's wrong with you. Same thing with legal problems. Think in advance, what actually am I paying you for? Or what actually are you paying me for? It's not always just greedy people. It really sometimes is different understandings. I, my standard thing is I'll work for you now for a you know, fixed price, and in the future, if it starts making money, I get a little take on that too, and that's just my compensation package. Well, that's fine if we both know that. But if only one of us knows that, we end up in court. That's where you don't want to be. So think about all of those terms. If it's really important stuff, do hire one of my people to do this for you. But if it's fairly straightforward, just the two of you can just write it down. Do not download a form off the internet. Okay? Just don't. I have heard rumors that some of the things on the internet are true. Have y'all ever come across that? That there might be things that are inaccurate on the internet? No. I mean, I didn't think that was possible. I thought that they had to keep it. This is still on. I'm going to turn this off before it starts buzzing. Um, I've heard rumors about that. I mean, I can't substantiate it. But just in case that's true, yes, seriously, the legal agreements that you guys can get to for free are just as bad as some of the, we saw Elvis last week, stuff on the internet. Just don't use them. You're better off writing stuff on your own, honestly. An exception to that is the um, Creative Commons licenses. Those are more of a share kind of how you share your work. It's not used as much between two people in a commercial deal. But if you are publishing your work or self-publishing your work and you want people to be able to use it, the Creative Commons licenses are great. They are legally binding and they are well drafted. I have never seen any, well, I mean the GNU stuff is also, but I've, from software people I've heard pros and cons on it. But from a legal standpoint it's good. Whether it fits what you like substance wise on your software or not, that's software-y stuff beyond what I know. I know the Creative Commons licenses are good. Use them freely. They have human explanations for the legal that follows, and I have always found that the human explanations are accurate. What follows is what they say will follow. If you, if you read the little human readable text that tells you what's in this contract, that's actually what's in the contract. Again, that's not always true either. I have seen internet, oh, here's my free form that I downloaded to use. Well, and here's the summary of what this is supposed to be. And then you actually read the contract and it's not what it says. So seriously, do not download stuff for free on the internet. Do not download stuff from anything that purports to be a legal website that's giving it away for free or that has Zoom in its name. <laughs> you, what you're getting is not good. One other thing to be aware of is that, okay, I told you a few minutes ago, I'm not a trial lawyer, right? So there's a lot of stuff I don't know. The Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, for instance. I knew it when I was in law school, because I took a whole year of it. And I knew it for the bar exam, because, yeah, it was on it. And the bar exam was a few years ago. <coughs> and I haven't thought about those rules since then, because they're completely irrelevant to what I do for a living. So I've got no clue what to do if I end up in a courtroom. I know I'm supposed to call the judge your honor. I'm supposed to dress up nice before I walk in the room. After that, it gets hazy. I didn't even do moot court. So I don't litigate. And I know I don't litigate, and I would be an idiot to represent myself or someone else in trial. It's kind of like asking your dermatologist to do your heart surgery. I mean, yeah, 
she'd probably do a better job than, you know, your butcher would, but not as good as someone who's actually a heart surgeon. So yeah, I would be a better trial lawyer than, you know, the guy that runs the bakery would, but not as good as a trial lawyer. There's a difference, though, between what I just said and what a trial lawyer will tell you about drafting contracts. Trial lawyers are kind of like surgeons. Okay, how many of you are, are trial lawyers? I'm now offending you. Excellent. Um, sorry. You're not offended. Give me a second. I'm working up to it. Um, trial lawyers are like surgeons. You gotta have some ego if you're gonna slice someone's chest open, right? Well, you gotta have some ego if you're gonna be a trial lawyer. Obviously, I'm humble and mild, so <laughs> transactional lawyers are very different. But if you've got that kind of ego, sometimes it kind of carries over a little too far. I am perfectly willing to tell you guys, I have no idea how to run a trial. I have never really run across a trial lawyer who won't say, oh yeah, I can write a contract. They can't, really. They think they can. And what you get from them is like, really? That's... Yeah, it, it sucks. So don't hire a trial lawyer to write your contract, even though the trial lawyer will tell you that he can. No, he can't. It won't be good. Get you a contract lawyer to write you a simple contract. Um, there are some legal sites with contracts on them you can use, but they're ones that lawyers get access to for money, so you're out of luck. In Georgia, we do have one other resource, which is the Georgia Lawyers for the Arts. They have some form files down in their library over at King Plow Center. And they um, have some stuff, I think, on an online database now. I'm not certain how far that project came. But the Georgia Lawyers for the Arts are actual lawyers. They represent artists. Um, if you're a traditional starving artist, they will give, do some pro bono work. If you're a marginally well-fed artist, they give you a cut rate. Um, but they've got IP lawyers who will help. And they do have form files that are good, because they were actually written by lawyers, not by someone to put some crap on the internet. So those are some resources for contracts, but again, the thing I really want to drive home is make sure you know the terms of your license. You can make it temporary, you can say I'm giving you the right to use this painting, but I'm keeping the rest of the rights. I can also use this painting. Well, if you're the one with the novel and you're buying the cover art, well, do you want to see that cover art showing up somewhere else? You may not care, or you may really not want to see it showing up somewhere else. Well. That's the kind of detail you settle in advance. But you can make it however you want it to be. Sometimes if you are an artist and you are you know, selling a piece of work, usually artists are really excited when they sell pieces of work, well, you stop and think, does that mean I can also sell prints of it or no? Well, look in the contract that you're about to sign. If you're a new artist and the company that's buying it from you is a big company, guess how many rights they are leaving you in that agreement? Zero. None! Kind of like if you're a first-time author and you just got a publishing contract. This rocks! I'm going to be published by a real publishing house. And they say, okay, so we will own the copyright in perpetuity. We will own the rights to the e-books, any other technology that someone thinks of later. We own that too. You can never have it back. You can never use it. We will probably leave your name on the cover, but we might change it. And every few quarters, we'll send you, uh, you know, 3% of the profits after we deduct our overhead and our expenses and our coffee and that new car we wanted. So read the terms, know what you're getting. If you are a first time author, you're not gonna get good terms. You're just not. If you're a first time artist, yeah, you're not gonna get good terms either. But you can ask. One thing that some of the artists that I've represented in the past have talked about is when you actually license away or sell your artwork, Usually, you're not allowed to use it at all because the people want, you know, I've, I've commissioned you to do this for me and now it's mine, right? Even though we're licensing it, not selling it because you can't sell intellectual property, you don't license it. But nevertheless, yeah, I'm buying it from you and I own it. Well, can I use it in my portfolio still? Well, under the terms of most of these license agreements from the big companies, the answer is no. You have no right to use it at all. But if you ask them, hey, I'm, you know, self-promoting sometimes. I need stuff in my portfolio, and I'm actually selling this to you, and I'm really excited about it. Can I please keep this in my portfolio so people can see that, look, I really did sell something once, and it was pretty good. I won't sell copies of it, I won't sell it to someone else, but I just want it in my portfolio. That kind of thing, they usually will let you have, because they don't care. That doesn't hurt the marketability or the value of what they're getting from you. If you're able to still sell it elsewhere, it does hurt. It may, in their mind, impact the value of what they're getting from you. But 
just using it in the portfolio, or gosh, I'd already you know sent out to the print run to have a calendar of you know, I've now drawn 12 pictures, um, and this was the 12th, and it's December, and it's already being printed. Can I sell those po those calendars? Well, eh, maybe, maybe not, but the ask. There is no contract that can't be changed before it's signed. They can say no, but then you just decide, is it worth it to make the deal or not? Sometimes you can use that if they say no, you can leverage it, well then you should pay me a little extra or something. And sometimes they'll just say, no, there are other artists, do you want to sell this or not? In which case you get very quiet and say yes please. But don't be afraid to ask about the terms of contracts. That's something that's come up a lot recently, I'm not sure why, but people's like, well, I didn't want to let them have that, and I was afraid to ask to have this changed because I was afraid they'd change their minds and walk away. Well, I mean, they may well say no, but if the person that you're dealing with who's offered you money for whichever brilliant piece of creativity you've put down in a fixed medium is the sort that will be so affronted by you saying, hey, would it be okay if I continue to use this in my portfolio? If they're so offended by that that they're going to say, oh yeah, screw you, the deal's off, and walk away, you can just call that a narrow escape because you do not want to do business with those people. I've never had a legitimate company say, how dare you ask to change the terms? You can't have the money, the deal is off. They won't do that. They may say no, but that's the worst that's going to happen. Okay, we've talked about licensing. We've talked, let me look and see what else I'm supposed to talk to you about. Um, work made for hire. This is another situation where you want to know what the deal is before there's a problem. If you work for someone else, that someone else probably thinks that if you create stuff, they get some of it. Now, if you are an engineer who works for, or a you know, creative scientist of some really brainy sort, that works for a university, or that works for a research group, or that works for a large company in industry, or works for 3M or something, and you invent something very clever while you work for them, guess who owns it? That ain't you. And when you started employment there, in your employee handbook, that little notebook they gave you that's in the bottom drawer of your desk that you never read, there probably is something in there explaining just how little you own of what you produce. Now, if you produce it in the course of your job, you absolutely aren't going to own it. But there have been really painful cases where someone really created something on their own. And then the company said, dude, no, you created it while you were employed by us. We own it. The term, the legal decisions of how you decide if something is a work made for hire, meaning the boss owns it, not you, um, they vary because, like I said, litigators make sure that there's never a clear answer and transactional and academic folks kind of enjoy that too. So we make it complicated. And some of the terms in that analysis are actually really stupid now because so the old analysis was pretty much geographic. You know, where did you do the work? Did you do it at work or at home? Did you do it during work hours or off work hours? Did you use company supplies or your own supplies? Well, okay, most of you have jobs. So is there on time and off time? No, your phone's ringing and the emails are coming in, you're supposed to answer them. Okay, well, it's the company's computer versus yours. Well, you have the laptop, you carry it with you. When do you use it? Yeah, all the time. Did they buy it or did you buy it? Well, it's the only thing you use. Well, okay, that's theirs, but you know, you used it at home while well, you were also working at home. The lines have blurred a lot. So a lot of the old analysis isn't clear. And if it's not clear, guess who's probably going to win? It's not you. Um, there's also a old phrase that most of you have heard about how much justice can you afford. If your employer is a large company, they already have some of my people working for them, either directly or on retainer somewhere, and you don't. So before you sign something, before you start work, or before you start creating what this is, if you're already employed, get an agreement in place. When you are hired, you can carve out. If you say, you know, I write poetry on the side. Could you please, you know, I just want to be clear that any poetry I write is mine, not yours. Now, if you're a bricklayer, that's pretty obvious. But if you're working for a literary magazine, eh, you wrote some poetry, is it ours or yours? Well, if it's worth money, it's ours. That's our theory. If it's not worth anything, yes, you can have it. But make sure, again, preventive medicine. Figure out ahead of time before you finish the thing and start to sell it especially if you're a game designer or a web designer and you are then doing web design on the side or you are creating your own game. I mean, that's great, but make sure it's okay 
and make the agreement before you get there. Okay, um, how are we on top? Okay, just a few more remarks, then I can take some questions if we need to. Um, fair use is a hotly debated topic. And I want to talk a little bit about that. How many of y'all have at least heard the term fair use? And you're all ready to hear about it. Okay. Fair use is something that is a little bit more dangerous to rely on than you probably think. We know that fair, fair use, I'll back up one step, it's in the statute. It means that there are certain uses that would otherwise be infringement, like um, using a copy of part of the book in a literary critique or making a parody of the underlying work, or things like that. There are some things that would be an infringement, but Congress decided that it's important to allow these things to occur. Classroom use is one of my favorites. I can make copies of stuff to use in my classroom. Well, I can't do it in a book. Luckily, my editor caught that one. I was like, no, this is educational. No, you moron, you're writing a book. Oops, yeah, we gotta get permission, which is actually my I'm going to go back to remind you about the Creative Commons. If you're trying to use something that belongs to someone else, rather than assume that I can just rely on fair use, there's a much easier way to deal with it. Ask. Now, if it's Disney, they're going to say no. Don't, don't waste your time asking. But, you know, their lawyers are really big and vicious and will come and kill you. So don't steal from the mouse. But if I was writing a textbook and I wanted to expose my students to the Lawrence Lessig stuff, to the copy left sharing agreements, really, and because it's something that we don't usually teach in law school. And I said, well, I could try to rephrase a lot of the stuff he says, or I could take, you know, the first couple chapters of one of his books and let him explain his ideas, rather than me explain him explaining his ideas. And I'm like, okay, I'm pretty sure that if I'm going to copy a couple chapters, i got to ask him for permission. Well, this man, of course, is the guru of, you know, share freely. And I thought, okay, I'm going to send him an email. He's tenured at really good schools, and I really am not important. And I'm going to send him this email and ask if I could just blatantly copy three chapters from his, from content of his old books, but still, and use it in my book. It's a textbook. I mean, it's not a something that's ever going to make money, but still. And I thought, okay, this is going to be great. I'm going to have this really cool story to tell my students and to bitch about at DragonCon panels in the future that he either completely blew me off, never got back to me, his secretary sent me a dismissive answer, or he said, hell no, you can't use that. You have to pay me a lot of licensing fees. And that's not what happened. Actually, he's a very gracious and kind person. Um, before that day was over, he had sent me a very sweet email saying, oh, of course, please feel free to use it. I mean, I know you're, on, you're going to credit it, you're a copyright lawyer. Please use it as much as you want. If you have any questions or if you need anything else, just you know, drop me a line. But <coughs> feel free to use as much of that as you want in your book. So he's not a hypocrite. He's not a jerk. Um, he really means this stuff. But I asked, can I steal some of your stuff and put it in my stuff? And he said, yeah, sure, go ahead. A lot of people will. They'll say, well, make sure you say it's mine, but yeah, go nuts. Or, well, you know, if you start making a lot of money on it, I want a little piece of the money. But a lot of them will say, sure. So ask. If you get permission, you don't have to worry about fair use because it's not infringement if you get permission. So sometimes the best thing to do is ask. Now, this runs contrary to how most of us think, which is it's easier <coughs> to get forgiveness than to get permission. In this case, it's the opposite. Ask. See if you can get permission. Fair use is tricky. Because not only is it huge and amorphous, and lawyers can argue about it for days at a time, and often do, but we argue about it for days at a time at $450 to maybe $1,000 an hour in a courtroom in front of a judge, and you'll be paying that bill. Um, keep in mind, if you are accused of infringement, then you get to say, oh wait, it was fair use. It is a defense to an action for infringement. It's not like a standalone right that you have. You're in court, or you have been accused of infringing someone's work, and you say, oh, yes, but I'm allowed to. And there's lawyers involved at this stage. And this is getting expensive. And if at the end of the trial you win, and indeed it was a use that was fair, and you were allowed to do it, you know how much money you take home with you? You get nothing. The answer is, you're not in trouble. But your legal bill is due. So be careful relying on fair use, because it will be expensive and uncertain. If you have done something that you think is transformative and you've put your brilliant piece of mashup art on your website or you've posted the video on YouTube or whatever it is, when you get one of those takedown notices, 
If it's on YouTube, they just take it down. But if you get one of those takedown notices, how many of y'all have actually gotten one of those so far? Oh, righty. Um, there are, there's a lot of misinformation floating around on those too. Have y'all heard the stuff about, well, there's, um, as long as you've changed more than 10% of the underlying work, it's not infringement. Okay, right away quick, that sounds like a real straightforward rule, doesn't it? My people will never allow that. There are no straightforward rules. There's no 10% or 6% or whatever the different rules are floating around out there. They're all wrong. It's mushy. But so you hear that, and then you hear, well, if you get the takedown notice, what was it one of my clients was trying to convince me? That after the first takedown notice, you have six months before the second notice, and then three months after the second notice is when you really have to have taken it down. I have no idea where that came from. There's nothing even vaguely related to that in the law. A takedown notice, frankly, is a courtesy. It's, you're small potatoes and we probably don't really want to sue you today. So we're giving you the opportunity to stop doing what's pissing us off without suing you. It's a warning shot across the bow saying, seriously, the next thing's going to be the lawyers knocking on your door. Take that crap down now. You know what you ought to do when you get one of those? Either look into your bank account and say, yes! I'm going to hire a big lawyer, and I'm going to win. This is going to be great. That's fine. Fight the good fight. Set some good precedent. But if when you look at your bank account, it doesn't say lots of zeros that I can give a litigator, just take it down. Because the fact that you've got that takedown notice means that they do have a lawyer. And whether it's fair or whether it's right or not, I hate when otherwise good people who just thought they were doing something they were allowed to do and who might actually have been right. It may have been something that, if you work through the analysis, probably should be a fair use. If you end up in trial, it's still going to suck and it's going to be expensive. And you don't want to be there unless, seriously, you can afford to underwrite the trial, in which case, go nuts. Rely on fair use, fight the good fight. But make sure you can afford it. I had a client who came to me desperate because he was about to have to go file bankruptcy and had already taken out the second mortgage on his house because he was certain that his use was fair and frankly I think it was. When I looked through the legal analysis of it, I think he was correct. But he was a couple hundred thousand dollars into the lawsuit and that was a couple hundred thousand more than he had to spend. And it, even though he was right, he was also now bankrupt. Don't be that guy. So sometimes it's practical. If you can afford it, go nuts. Uh, what is it? If there's anything else I really wanted to talk about, that is most of it. Y'all have questions? Yes? If you get a takedown notice and you, you do what they say, can they still come after you for uh, civil uh, penalties? It's all civil penalties. There's yeah. not really criminal stuff yeah. going on here. There are very weird cases where there might be copyright criminal stuff, but that's strange not really what we're talking about. Um, Usually the deal is they say, if you take it down, then we're done. Make sure that you do that. You call them back or write them back and say, okay, I will take it down, but that means we're cool, right? And usually they'll say yes, because at that point there's really no money involved, right? And all of us in law school are taught one of the basic rules of law, which is don't sue the poor. It's really not worth most companies' effort to come after you for whatever it is you've done. They will send the legal notice, and if you don't take it down, then yeah, they are going to come after you because there's precedent and they're enforcing things. But other than the recording industry, I've been mean, losing its ever-loving mind and suing students and all that nonsense. And even they've come around. They're not doing that as much anymore. Y'all heard the horrible cases about the kid who actually streamlined the um, database on his um, school's computer, and some other people posted some pirated music, and they went after him. He hadn't even posted any of the pirated music. And the record companies just were evil. I think that they woke up in those couple of years and said, hmm, the industry's changing. It's going to be really hard for us to continue to protect our content as much because this digital stuff is happening and we just can't get people to go back to vinyl. Um, so what could we do? Because it's really scary. We don't like the direction this is going. Hey, I know. Let's really piss off the people who buy our music. Yeah. That'll help. I mean, seriously, I don't know what they were thinking or what they were smoking. But they did vindictively go after people. That one kid in particular, they you know, pretty much said, well, how much is in your bank account? And he's like, I've got 12,000 bucks saved up for my summer job. He said, that's how much it's going to cost to get you out of trouble. This is just bullshit. But they did it for a while. That's the vindictive exception to the rule. That's usually not what's going to happen. If any, you make nice and take it down, that's usually the end of it. Is there any statute of limitations? 
there is always a statute of limitations for something, and it's usually two years from when the act is discovered. Okay. So regardless, after two years, you'll be clean. But it's fine to ask them, hey, I will take it down, but I want you to agree you're not coming after me. That's fine. Sometimes they'll do that. Sometimes they'll say, dude, just I'm not going to go after you. It's fine. And usually they won't because they don't want to. They want to fix this now. Yeah. I have a question. I filed the copyright on a book and then um, I sent back because I have uh, included a chapter in the book and I said it was two works and I filed for a single work. And so then they said that um, I couldn't just resubmit it. I had to then pay again to file for um, a, a single book. Uh, and huh. I was like, that's stupid. But well, you've got a really bitchy examiner, I guess. I've never heard of that happening before. Oh, I've heard, I've heard, I've heard. Usually, usually you can say, no, dude, it's, comp oh, yeah, it's yeah, it's call good. it a compilation. But usually you can put all kinds of stuff together and make it one work. I mean, a work is what you say it is. But if, I mean, there's a point where you're arguing with the government. Yeah. And you can figure out how well that's going to work for you. If they say take that chapter off and spend another thirty-five bucks to file it with the other book, you kind of just got to do it. Okay. The trademark office sometimes does similar things. I had to go back and forth with one of the trademark examiners, and I'm sorry, well, we did not go back and forth. He told me, and I said yes. Um, the, on one of the filings we I had made, the logo was you know kind of a cobalty blue, and I think I called it medium blue, and the examiner wrote back and said, well. There are some grievous flaws in your application, and you're going to have to either fix them or I'm going to deny it. And then I looked down to see what these horrible flaws were. Man, I just screwed that up. What's down there? Well, you know what's down there? Him saying, this should be called cobalt, not medium blue. I'm like, seriously? <laughs> um, and so I changed it to cobalt blue because it makes absolutely no difference. And we were good. And so bitch if the next time I filed on that same ink with the logo that they had changed into a different logo but same color I called it cobalt and I wish I were making it up guess what the examiner that I got that time told me to do medium blue yep so that company has one logo that is medium blue and one that is cobalt blue and it's the exact same color but I don't care because it doesn't matter and I could have argued with them for months and they would have just said yeah, no I'm a petty bureaucrat flipboard bitch and that'd be the end of my um, <laughs> Trademark, so I said yes. And if they're doing that to you, which is stupid, just smile and say, okay, you're going to lose if you argue it. Okay, well, then my follow up question to that one is because that was such a pain, but I didn't file for any of my other ones yet. So, but I've heard, is it true? Because you hear all these things about what is copied or whatever. As a general rule, all of that stuff you heard is wrong. Okay, <laughs> so then um, I heard that if I didn't file after six months after I published it, then I would be right to my file it uh, afterwards. Is that true? So should, can I retroactively um, file it? File it, and I still get okay. file them, file them, file them, file them. Um, another thing that sometimes people hear, which is just seriously stupid and not true, I'll, I'll be clear. No, it's stupid. It's not ill thought. It's just dumb. Um, poor man's copyright. Who's heard this one? You put it in an envelope, mail it to yourself. Certified or whatever. Uh, yeah. No, <laughs> that just doesn't work. No judge ever will open that envelope and be impressed by what's in it. Just don't do that. Poor man's copyright is the 35 bucks to file at the Library of Congress. I mean, if you're a photographer, you don't have to file each photograph. Take all of them from a photo shoot. Look, it's a compilation. File that. Now, I would recommend after you do that, if there's one or two shots in there that are really good that you really think are going to make you some money, I like doing those separately just because it's a little cleaner, those are the ones you're really going to be promoting and exploiting. I like to file those separately. Not required, but it's easier and cleaner later, but file it. Back. Um, I, uh, I make art from old comics, mm -hmm. uh, and some of them are the, are the ones that are like free, not for resale, and I'm taking it and I'm cutting it up and collaging it and selling it as art. Yeah, that would be resale. Okay. <laughs> You've made a derivative work, which if they gave you permission to use it, uh -huh. is not a derivative work is you know, I've taken your art, I cut it up and made it into new art. That's as good an example as I took your painting and sliced it into stripes and wove it together into a plaid. And this is my derivative work. If I did not have permission, that derivative is what we call infringement. Um, if I do have permission, then the permission I have is what I was given. I talked about in a license agreement, you can give whichever permission you want. You can give them the rights forever and ever, amen, and all of the rights I own are yours now, or I can give you the right just to use it on the cover of this book, 
you know, it's whatever deal we make. Well, if these were made available to you with the understanding or with the terms that you may use these freely, but you cannot resell them, well, then you can't resell them. If, if I buy a comic, and I, I'm not talking about like prints of it, but like I buy a comic and I cut that up and I collage it over a, over a plaster or something or other, because I bought that comic and I'm using materials I bought, would that also be legally resold? Or I it's actually a really funny question okay. because there are a lot of cases about that. And there was a case even that I, when I ran across this line of cases, I'm like, seriously? My people really need help. Um, and it was a art print that someone had purchased the print, first sale doctrine, I own this tangible copy, I can rip it up, but they took it and decoupaged it onto a tile and then sold the tile. Well, okay, I own this piece, I can resell this tangible thing that I bought, right? I can't copy it, but I could, well, but what they had just done was change it, modify it, and that's one of the rights that the author owns. So by posting it on the tile, they may have transformed it into a derivative work, in which case it's a violation, but that transformation may have been a fair use, so it's okay, or it may have just been too stupid for the court to talk about in the first place. There are cases on every side of it. When you rip it up, it's more clearly a changed derivative work and usually that is a fair use. If you're really going to be selling these in public, get permission. That would be my advice because the cases go every different way on that. There should be a clear answer. There's not. Am I done? One more question or are we done? One more question. One more question. Yes. Are NDAs online something that are okay to like the free NDAs that they provide? Who's they? Like, like, if you pull up an NDA online to provide to people... Oh, yeah, no, it's going to be crap. Okay. <laughs> so, so... My people don't give away good stuff for free. Okay. Ever. Um, if you're getting it from somewhere reputable, that's a legal aid or something like that, there, you know, it may be okay, but if you just pulled it up online as an example of an NDA, it's going to be awful. Okay. Um, it may be completely unenforceable, and NDAs and non-competes and those kinds of things actually are a little bit tricky. Different states have different rules and there are times when if you draft them too broadly they become completely unenforceable. But if you draft them too narrowly you don't get the protection you wanted. So you have to know the parameters of what you're doing with those in particular. Plus, if you didn't have someone draft it for you, are you sure you know what's in it? Well, I would read through it. I mean, sometimes they're clear enough to do that with and sometimes they're not. So it, it's, it's a danger. It may be better than nothing, but most of the ones I have seen really are crap. Um, sometimes you can get examples of things like that from um, chambers of commerce or from a sec I mean, the corporation division or the Secretary of State. Um, for instance, if you're trying to file a corporation or something, they've got some files there and some forms that are not bad for those things. But you're getting them from the Chamber of Commerce or the Secretary of State. Those are not bad. Sometimes you will find another organization that's at least reputable, but again, you're getting a sure. form that someone wrote, and even if what they wrote was really good, it may not be what you need, or it may not work in your state, because NDAs and um, non-competes are state by state. And so you can end up with a world of trouble and not really understand why. Okay. It's the stuff you get off the internet for free is usually worth what you paid for it. The problem being you can end up relying on it and get damaged as a result. Okay, and we have to stop. Sorry. <laughs> I'll be back tomorrow. Um, and I will be outside for a few minutes if you have a couple of dying questions. Not near the door, though, so we won't be blocking. <laughs> Thank you so much.